Uh, welcome to Preventative FASD Education Events for Pregnancy Healthcare Providers, presented by Dr. Hilary Brown, Christina Kenton, uh, Dr. Jocelyn Cook, Dr. Lisa Graves, and Dr. Nana Juma, and Natalie Pembrin. My name is Madhu Gaber, and I'm a bilingual project assistant at HealthNexus. <clears throat> so HealthNexus um, oversees several provincial initiatives relating to, related sorry, to FASD. We allocate subsidies every year to 40 plus support groups for individuals with FASD and their families. We designed an online training for service providers from various sectors, including healthcare and nursing, education, mental health and addictions, justice and corrections, and community and social work. And lastly, we manage the FASD provincial website, fasdinfotestaf.ca, where you can find recent and up-to-date information about what's happening, learn more about resources and tools, and find out ser services available in your local community. A few house rules um, for the presentation. So we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A section. And remember not to use identifiable information when asking the questions. Before we start the presentation, I would like to begin by doing a land acknowledgement. HealthNexus is located on territory that for thousands of years has been the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabewaki, Wendaki, Nyon, Wensayo, Haudenosaunee, and more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. We're proud to take part, take our part, sorry, in the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Bell Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes. HealthNexus team members are grateful for the opportunity to partner with indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and to work on this territory. Now I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, so Dr. Jocelyn Cook received a Bachelor of Science degree, Honors Biology, from Bishop's University, and then a PhD in Reproductive Psychology from the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Cook studied the effects of alcohol consumption on preterm birth for her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Alberta. She also completed an MBA with a focus on economics and health policy from the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Cook was an assistant professor at the in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Science at the University of Saskatchewan before joining the Government of Canada, where she held a number of executive leadership roles in the um, <clears throat> sorry leadership roles at the Public Health Agency, Health Canada, Assisted Human Reproduction Canada, and the executive director of the CIHR Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. Dr. Dr. Cook joined the Society of Obstetrician and Gynecologist of Canada as its first chief scientific officer in 2014 with the vision of facilitating the strengthening, the strengthening of, recognition of, and incorporation of academics, science, and evidence into the work of the SOGC of the, sorry, I'm losing my tracks here. Evidence into the work of the SOGC, sorry, and our membership. In our in her role, Dr. Cook oversees and all activities related to the academic programs, clinical practices, guidelines, research, JOGC operation, and public health related activities and programs. Dr. Cook also sits on the SOGC's board of directors and its executive committee, regional CME and AC AC. SC planning committees and represents the SOGC and its work nationally and internationally. Um, Nana Afwa Juma is an obstetrician gynecologist at the Thunder Bay Reg Region sorry, <laughs> Regional Health Sciences Centre and a researcher at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Dr. Juma's research and clinical practice focuses on Indigenous women's health and substance use in pregnancy in Northwestern Ontario. Through a series of integrated research studies, Dr. Juma seeks to determine how to organize a model of care that addresses the needs of substance-involved pregnant women living in rural and remote areas in order to improve maternal and neonatal outcomes. 
Lisa Graves is a graduate of the University of Ottawa. She completed her residency in family medicine and enhanced skills uh, training in maternal and child health at McGill University. She is currently a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Western Michigan University, Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine in Kalamazoo, Michigan. She's the author of, of the over 100 peer-reviewed publications related to her interest in substance use in pregnancy, health equity, and medical education. Hilary Brown, PhD, is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Health and Society and the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. She's also an adjunct scientist at Women's College Hospital. Dr. Brown holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Disability and Re Reproductive Health. Her research program examines maternal and child health and mental health ac across the life cor course, <clears throat> sorry, with a focus on populations with disabilities and chronic illness, health equity, and the social determinants of health. Natalie Pembran is a mother of three children from Red River Settlement. She's a Métis midwife who has practiced for 18 years in primary, primarily um, in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory with Indigenous teens and newcom newcomers to Canada. They recently re relocated to Victoria as a guest on Lekwungen People's Territory this summer. A founding member of the National Aboriginal Council, Council of Midwives, NACM, and past co-chair and staff, Natalie has uh, been instrumental in building unique partnerships between CAM and NACM midwifery associ as associations that respect self-determination, reciprocity, and humility. Thank you for listening and to contact the FASD team at HealthNexus, you can email fasdsupport at healthnexus.ca. I'm now going to stop sharing and hand it over to Dr. Jocelyn Koch. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Bienvenue en français. And it's great to see so many familiar faces. To be fair, I only see the panelists, but I see all the names. And so it's nice to see many of you that are here. Um, I think we have a really exciting program today. I'm not going to take up a lot of time, um, but I think that, you know, Health Nexus does so much work um, with outreach and the public uh, population. And I think that hearing from our panel of esteemed healthcare providers really brings a unique um, perspective and experience to the work that Health Nexus does um, in terms of collaborations and partnerships. And so we really hope that you get something useful out of this webinar today and that you enjoy it. These speakers are all incredible and we've all actually worked together and have a lot of fun together. And so I'm turning it over to Dr. Juma, the first speaker, and carry it away and have a great time, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Jocelyn. I'm very excited to be here. I'm just going to put my um, presentation up. Um, I hope everybody can see my presentation right now. So um, thank you very much for having me as part of this panel. Uh, I think this is a really important issue and one that I see in my practice on a daily basis. Uh, as Malou said, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and I practice in both Thunder Bay, Sioux Lookout, um, and as well as serving remote fly in First Nations communities in Northwestern Ontario. Uh, and unfortunately, in this area where we have a, a lot of rural and remote communities, um, and even within urban centers, um, we do have a really high rate of substance use, including alcohol use amongst the general population. And of course, if those rates are high in the general population, they're also high um, amongst um, people who are of reproductive age. Uh, and one of the things that really interests me is um, how especially more marginalized populations are perceived with respect to um, substance involvement and alcohol use. And of course, for me, that interest um, lies in reproductive health as an obstetrician gynecologist. And I sit on a prenatal coalition that um, in our, for our region that aims to improve outcomes for pregnant people and um, newborns and infants. 
And one of the things that came to our attention um, was uh, this advertisement. It's for a local restaurant. They were starting a new initiative to encourage people to come to the restaurant um, on days when you know it wasn't quite as busy as, as others. So Wednesday afternoons, and in particular, they were targeting um, new parents, new families uh, who have young babies to come to the restaurant, um, drink alcohol, as you can see from the name, babies and brews. Uh, and a number, I was concerned as well as a number of members of the prenatal coalition because we didn't feel that this um, provided a, a, a good message to the community to encourage alcohol consumption amongst uh, new parents who have infants. When we looked into it more, this isn't something that is unique to our city, although it was the first time that we'd seen this in Thunder Bay. When we looked into it, we could find countless ads for similar type events all across the province and all across the country. And that really caused me to think about and examine what the relationship is between alcohol and pregnancy outside of the medical context of the, the issues that um, alcohol can cause in pregnancy and for um, children who are affected by alcohol use in pregnancy. But what does society say about alcohol use in pregnancy? So from a medical point of view, we know that alcohol can cause changes in growth, development, and behavior. We know there is no safe amount of alcohol in pregnancy. We know that no alcohol during pregnancy is safest for baby, and no alcohol while breastfeeding is also safest for baby. But what does society tell us? What are, what are pregnant and parenting people hearing in, in the wider um, conversation? Well, if you look, and you don't really have to look hard, um, you see advertisements like this. If you combine wine plus dinner, the new word is winner. There's a really mummy wine culture um, in contemporary society. Uh, and I encourage you to really look at these ads um, and look at who's in the ads, who's represented as we go through the presentation. I'm going to have a number of um, uh, similar ads throughout the presentation. In terms of what we know about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it impacts approximately 4% of Canadians, which is more than autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, and Down syndrome combined. So it has a really large impact on society. 90% of individuals with FASD also experience mental health issues, and the cost to our economy of FASD is almost $2 billion a year. So this spectrum of disorders um, has a huge impact on the individual, on families, and on the wider community as a whole. So uh, I wanna just examine this image. It's for Moms to Your Wine Festival. Um, and this is something that was widely publicized in all kinds of popular media, very respectable magazines, newspapers, online, um, and it's a wine festival um, targeted directly at new moms. Baby on the hips, wine on the lips. Uh, and so I encourage you to just to analyze this picture just a little bit more, scrutinize who's in it. It's obviously a Caucasian woman. She looks fairly affluent. She's got a baby on her hip and over, overflowing champagne glass in her hand. And this wine festival was something that was celebrated. And I want to contrast that with this next image that was publicly derided. This is Snooky. She's from some reality TV show that I don't know the name, um, but she is a Latino woman. Uh, she has her baby on her on her hip. She's got a wine glass in her hand to her lips. This image was she received so much derision um, uh, and disgust because of this image. And I challenge you to see what the difference is between the two images, other than one being of a young Latina woman and one being of an affluent Caucasian woman. And I just wonder if the Moms Tio Wine Festival, if, that, if they replace that image with an indigenous woman, with a woman with disabilities, with a black woman, 
if that image would have been celebrated in the same way. And I suspect my gut feeling is that it wouldn't. And why is that? And that's because societal perception of who is okay to drink alcohol in pregnancy and who it's not. And so pregnant people know this. They inherently know that if you're poor, if you're indigenous, if you're a person of color, that if you drink alcohol during pregnancy, or even if you're suspected of drinking alcohol in pregnancy, there's a risk that your baby could be taken away from you. Whereas if you're white, middle class, upper class, you can drink in public while pregnant or while breastfeeding your baby without any consequence. This was recognized by the Minnesota Organization for Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, um, which really took a look at who was drinking within that state. Uh, the perception was at the time that it was a Native American communities living in the state, it was a new immigrant population, it was a Black population who were had the highest risk of prenatal alcohol consumption. And when they actually did the studies, they found, in fact, that those groups had the lowest rates of alcohol consumption in pregnancy. And the highest rates of alcohol consumption in pregnancy of varying degrees were in more affluent people and, uh, and more so in Caucasian people compared to visible minorities. And that really caused them to change their messaging um, and to change their approach to uh, prevention for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So what are we supposed to do as um, providers who work with pregnant people? We're supposed to ask all reproductive age uh, or pregnant women about alcohol use. We're supposed to provide a brief intervention along with screening. We're supposed to create space during appointments to discuss alcohol use, and we're supposed to make specialized community-based interventions available and accessible to women with problematic drinking and related health and social concerns. Now, if we reflect back to the images that we were seeing earlier and society's interpretation of alcohol use in pregnancy, depending on the population that is perceived to be drinking alcohol, you can see how those interventions, those recommendations um, can themselves be inherently problematic if we bring those biases with us to that visit. This is another ad, babies and brews, because we can't be expected to parent without caffeine or alcohol. So how do we negotiate this dynamic? On the one hand, as healthcare providers, we're supposed to be screening and providing counseling. Um, but on the other hand, society is very actively promoting alcohol use in pregnancy and breastfeeding. We really need to understand our position of power and privilege with respect to the patient or client that's sitting in front of you. We need to learn about our patient or client as a person. We need to listen to their concerns and we need to reflect back to that individual, what we're hearing them say. We also need to be aware of which resources are available in our community and offer options rather than solutions. This is a brand of wine called Mom Life that's targeted directly at um, mothers. It's a pump and dump kind of day. Nap time is my happy hour. Motherhood powered by love, fueled by coffee, sustained by wine. Surviving motherhood one bottle at a time. So when we're negotiating this dynamic, oftentimes we're concerned both from a healthcare provider, social service provider point of view about the types of conversations that we need to have. And I can guarantee that if you're having these conversations with a patient who is using alcohol, especially if they are um, from a more marginalized group, uh, the, these concerns will be front of mind. And in particular, what I'm referring to is child protective services, because we do have a duty to report if there's a concern for child endangerment. In Canada, um, that does not apply to a fetus because a fetus is not a person under Canadian law. So there is no duty to report a pregnant woman who doesn't have children in her care who is using substances or alcohol. But it is important to engage in a conversation with that individual about their pregnancy 
to engage in support with them and to encourage self-reporting in a supportive environment to child protective services if you think there is potential for harm for that child um, once it's born. Sorry, one of the things that I think is um, in my conversations with other healthcare providers in our region is, you know, how do we get these conversations started when we have a woman who um, discloses that she's been drinking in pregnancy, or we have a pregnant person who we suspect is drinking in pregnancy, or we have an individual who comes to an appointment who is obviously um, uh, inebriated. So I always like to sort of reframe uh, that conversation. Um, and so I'm going to give three um, possible ways to address those uh, types of situations um, just in conclusion of my presentation. So if you have a pregnant person who discloses that she's drinking in pregnancy, usually what I say to her is that it was very brave of you to share that with me. Can we talk about this some more? If a woman shares that she's been drinking but cutting down, I really want to encourage her. And so I say, that's a really big step. How can I support you to reach your goal? Again, trying to empower that woman um, in the steps that she's already taking. And finally, if a patient comes to their appointment already intoxicated, I'm concerned about you. Tell me about your day really wanting to negotiate that dynamic about what people think, how they're viewed in society, and what we know as healthcare providers. So thank you for your attention, um, and enjoy the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Nana. Um, uh, um, I'm just going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Lisa. Lisa Graves while she gets her slides organized and Lisa is going to talk um, a little bit about the you know what the healthcare provider can can do in terms of of prevention of FASD and alcohol use during pregnancy and talk a little bit about uh, probably the SOGC's uh, guidelines and so take it away Lisa. Um, thank you Jocelyn and thank you Nana for really framing um, beautifully sort of, you know, where we need to start situating um, how we're talking about alcohol, how we're, the conversations we're, we're, we're having, because I think that, that, that this will hopefully add some um, context to what can be um, in the next few minutes, a little bit of dry information about kind of what the recommendations are, um, and hopefully provide you with a, with a sense of hope um, around actually um, uh, screening for um, uh, for um, alcohol use uh, throughout the lifespan. So we know that um, that that alcohol is there. Um, we know that it's out there in society. We know that there are attitudes there. Um, we know that despite a lot of our efforts, we haven't been as successful as we'd like in actually moving the numbers. The information is out there, but how is it being used and how are we making um, individuals feel comfortable, comfortable having conversations about alcohol use? And so part of this presentation is to help rethink and reframe some of the, some of the conversation around alcohol that takes it both inside and outside of pregnancy, knowing that there's no safe lower limit for alcohol use during pregnancy. So I can't, I can't tell someone this amount is okay and this amount isn't because the, the, the data, the literature and the science really isn't that crisp. I'm going to be referring a lot to the, the guidelines and we will make that resource available for all of you. So every, every visit, every clinical encounter, and I'm speaking as a family physician, but every time there can be an opportunity to discuss alcohol use. And I think that's really important because we need in some ways to frame this conversation about health, about being healthy, about what is a healthy relationship with alcohol. And again, focusing solely on sort of the, now you are pregnant and we must do something is, is very sort of centered around um, the fetus and around sort of a, a, a sense of, of taking away 
um, the, the opportunity to view individuals as holistic individuals of whom pregnancy is one part of their lives. So again, thinking about including this in more opportunities and more discussions, addressing it before there's a thought of pregnancy or between pregnancies is really an important conceptual idea that again will help I think start to address some of the uh, anxiety, fear and stigma that comes from both sides of the equation, um, both uh, care providers as well as our patient population. Certainly all of you will be familiar with screening tools and quite frankly, I'm not gonna go through them because you can pick your favorite one. There are some that, that you may, some that may embed it in tools that you already use, some that you may have a personal preference for, some that work better or that you've modified for the communities in which you work. The key thing is to ask and for that asking to become part of what we, um, what we do as a routine part of providing care. The other thing group to think about is that for some of you and, uh, and those of us who may uh, be slightly older, um, may realize that a lot of the traditional training around how to ask was very directive. How much, how much alcohol do you consume during, uh, during a week? That doesn't address shifting patterns of use. So it can be useful to start off with some very generic questions. Do you, you, know, do, do, you, do you drink alcohol at all? Do you drink some alcohol? Tell me about, tell me about it. And, and, uh, and Nana used some wonderful language about how to start conversations about alcohol that don't feel like you're drilling down just to tick the information off on a form. We know that there are differences between um, between age groups, between social groups, between um, you know uh, other marginalized groups in the way that alcohol is consumed, and so thinking about how in the population that I'm that I'm caring for, that I'm serving, how do I ask questions about alcohol use that might get to the patterns of use that may be different because we are all looking after individuals who come from different places and different backgrounds. Um, there are some biases in screening of women who are least likely to be identified um, are over 35 years of age, social drinkers, highly educated and high socioeconomic status. And um, again, this reflects some of our provider biases. And, 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 and again, when you think about some of the images we saw and some of the societal perceptions, it's not a surprise that that happens. So again, getting used to the idea that this is a conversation for everyone and a discussion for everyone, again, is probably one of our next best steps in terms of thinking about how do we just bring this into being part of a regular conversation about one's ongoing health. I won't spend much time on brief intervention, but again, it is a technique that has been shown to be useful, particularly in alcohol use. It really is designed to provide some awareness and education, to provide some advice, and if needed, to provide some assistance. And those don't have to be complicated. One of the challenges that I often hear around asking questions about alcohol is what will I do if the answer is yes? Well, the answer, if the answer is yes, you may, you know, you, you, you may provide some, some advice, a simple solution, an idea, a what could be a next step. Um, your assistance may be, um, you know, following up with yourself to have a, a conversation about what options might work. Uh, again, it sometimes feels like a really big issue, but the fact is that brief intervention is often just helping to get the process started. For women for whom alcohol use is not a significant issue, it, it can be as simple as awareness, advice, and, um, and it's left at that. For others where assistance is needed, sometimes that becomes more challenging. But again, we often forget as providers ourselves, we are often the first step and sometimes the um, safer step for many individuals who are looking at the, um, you know, uh, uh, and, or, and or thinking about making some kind of change. So what do you do when you find a woman who, a person who is using alcohol during pregnancy? And I apologize the, the, to anyone, you know, the woman, the choice of woman is an editorial cho choice from the guidelines and I've pulled that out. Certainly there's good evidence for psychosocial interventions. 
But again, when we think about psychosocial interventions, we need to think about how do we do this without, without individuals feeling that they are at risk for um, consequences? How do we actually support treatment so it's not mired in, uh, in fear? And this is where, again, often your role as a provider, your role as someone who may have a relationship with someone uh, who may understand some of the dynamics, who may be able to provide that assistance in those first steps can be really helpful in brokering some of these, um, some of these that, that may want to be considered for change. But the other thing that people sometimes forget and that isn't ex as well known as I would like it to be, and really a, a primary th thrust of the most recent guidelines uh, from the SOGC around alcohol has been that there are things that you can do that, that perhaps that weren't necessarily there five or 10 years ago. And that is the fact that there exists some pharmacotherapy options for use during pregnancy. There's not a lot. But it is not an empty space where the uh, where we used to say, you know, the only option um, is psychosocial intervention. And for many individuals, they will be they will thrive in psychosocial interventions. They will thrive in the brief intervention space. But for other individuals, pharmacotherapy may be the option that you need to need to to get to. And so thinking about and knowing about some of the pharmacotherapeutic options, some of the medications that can be considered and whether or not they can be preconception, postpartum, or during pregnancy can be a really useful tool, I think, to give us all a sense that there are some additional tools that we can kind of pull out and from our toolbox and use in situations where um, it can feel a bit challenging to get at what, um, at what we could do to facilitate, to support um, uh, individuals in their change process. So I've, I've, got, a I've got a list here. Um, the slides will be available to you um, after this presentation, but I just wanted to make certain that um, for those of you, particularly those of you who may not be prescribers, that you were aware of some of these, these options. And for the prescribers, to consider thinking more deeply about the possibility of using this in the um, uh, in the population of individuals um, within reproductive age. Remember that benzodiazepines are a critical part of withdrawal management. When an individual has decided to stop using alcohol, benzodiazepines are an important part of that process. Knowing that they are safe for short-term use in pregnancy can very, be very helpful. Knowing that it can be safe during the time of breastfeeding can also be really important in making certain that the option to stop using alcohol at that moment is a safe and appropriate option. Thiamine, which we give to prevent a significant and a, a cognitive issue that can happen if, when alcohol is stopped suddenly, is safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Again, options that we have available to let people know that you can, we can make it safe for you to stop um, using alcohol if that is what you are choosing to do today. Now, Traxone, I, I hesitate to mention because I got an email about three or four days ago that we are in short supply of this in Canada. But again, it has been safely used in opioid use disorder um, for a long period of time and can also be of use in individuals with alcohol use disorder. Lovely safety profile for opioids, translatable um, into, um, into the alcohol use disorder population. Acamprosate is another emerging medication. Early, early evidence suggests it's safe in pregnancy. This is the kind of medication I'd have a very informed, um, informed discussion with someone about whether or not we would use this because the literature is emerging. It's not all there yet. But again, a really nice option uh, for someone who might uh, need uh, uh, daily therapy for alcohol use disorder. Um, and um, again, uh, in individuals who, um, for whom this appears to be the best option, it is a good choice to have on the docket. We have a couple of other medications that we can use outside of the pregnancy period. Uh, disulfiram um, is not, um, um, is not considered to be, be safe during pregnancy and needs to stop. 
But again, I, I, I'm hoping we're starting to think about the continuum, about whether or not we can use this in someone who is thinking about pregnancy or who, again, if the conversation extends beyond pregnancy, we have opportunities to, again, provide more options to individuals about what might be something that they would consider that could help them on their journey. Again, um, it can be used in breastfeeding. So again, an option for women who've done well on it prior to a pregnancy and may wish to restart, um, a restart following a pregnancy. Topiramate, again, avoid during pregnancy, um, but again, some suggestion, it's not first line, that again, if this has worked well for women who were not who were before the pregnancy, this might work well for individuals after a, after a pregnancy is completed. So again, thinking about this in the continuum, thinking about how um, it can be helpful for, um, uh, for individuals um, as sort of part of major. Finally, we have gabapentin. Um, again, not um, very limited data in pregnancy, probably not something in the first line. Um, it can be used in breastfeeding. There is a potential for gabapentin misuse and depending on your community, that may be more or less of a problem depending on where you're working. Um, but again, it's another medication that adds to the possible list of things that you can start a conversation about, depending on where someone is, prior to pregnancy, in pregnancy, after pregnancy. Again, as part of an ongoing conversation that really um, that really suggests, um, um, uh, again, uh, talking about options that go beyond uh, a psychosocial intervention. This is, this is a word from your family doctor. Um, one of the things that's really important is that if an, an infant is alcohol exposed, we need to think creatively about how to empower um, the, um, uh, um, the, the parents of this child to share that information with, their, with, their, with the person who's gonna pro be providing medical care for that child. Because these are can be infants that uh, through um, uh, through no fault of anyone, sort of fall through the cracks. And we know as we talk about FASD and the value of knowing that that is on the um, on the diagnostic spectrum when one's looking to help children grow and learn and be everything they can be. Knowing that and framing interventions related to that can be really critical. We need to work creatively, and it's easy as a family doctor who looks after the continuum of care to know that information. We need to think about ways to empower families to feel comfortable sharing that information with their pediatric care providers so that we don't have gaps in care um, um, or delays in diagnosis where it would be incredibly helpful for, um, for, for little ones. So a few final thoughts. Um, we need to make certain, I don't like the words need to be documented. That sounds a bit harsh, but I'm hoping you get the sense that we need to create a way that this information travels with children so that we can use it in a positive way and use it as a way to um, reflect the strengths of families as they work on ways to have that disclosure in a way that works for them and feels safe. Um, we need to avoid being fetocentric. Um, this is about everybody being healthy. And again, using that lens and framework in that longitudinal space can be really helpful. We need to remember that we can do a lot, even if times some of us feel frustrated, um, that, that we uh, providers often forget about the, the tremendous power that that relationship can have. And sometimes your office-based intervention, your clinic-based intervention, your home-based intervention um, can really be incredibly powerful. And there are opportunities to pair that with medical treatment, education efforts, and again, advocacy around creating this as a safe conversation that, um, that everyone can feel safe having those conversations. Because I believe there's no right time or wrong time to start a conversation about alcohol use. Um, it, you know, we focus on pregnancy because that's often a time when um, individuals are really um, often prepared to make significant changes. 
But in fact, if we want to make progress, if we want to move um, the effectiveness of what we're doing, then we probably need to be thinking about having those conversations across the across the timeline, across the lifespan, across the continuum, um, and recognizing that this is a health issue and not just something that sits solely in pregnancy. And I did provide my contact information at the end of my slide, slide deck. I will stop sharing and pass the baton back to Jocelyn. Thank you. Um, the, the very exciting um, work and opportunity. And I am a bit of a data geek, so I do love the documentation and data. And as Lisa said, just because really needing to understand um, what the needs are, what the supports are, and how the best approaches you know, can be, can be taken. And also, you know, there is a gap in the research and the evidence as Lisa suggested. And so any opportunities we do have as a, as a country um, to be able to understand what's happening in our population. And we're not like the Americans. We're not like the, the other countries in terms of our, of our contacts and our demographics and our health system and our approaches and interventions and, and really opportunities for support. And so I think it's, it's exciting and I'm a data geek. I'm going to put it out there, but the data is really important. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Hillary, who's going to talk, take what Lisa was talking more on the, on the healthcare, the individual provider perspective, and Lisa, or, and Hillary's going to bring it over into um, looking at programming and supports and services and public health. So over to you, Lori. Great, wonderful. Thanks for the introduction and for uh, the opportunity to participate on this panel. Um, like Jocelyn said, I'm going to focus more on sort of a systems level perspective on the accessibility of supports and services. Um, so just by way of background, I think as many of the people attending know, approaches to FASD prevention focus broadly on four levels. So at the highest level, we have broad awareness, building and health promotion strategies, such as campaigns for the general public. And although, the, although these are effective from an educational standpoint, they do have less of a direct impact on behavior. And so preventive efforts that are targeted towards individuals, of course, are critical. So next, of course, we have discussions of alcohol, pregnancy and related risks, as we've heard from our first two presenters on. Um, we also have specialized and holistic supports or treatment for pregnant individuals who are using alcohol. And finally, supports for new parents to maintain healthy changes they may have made during pregnancy, as well as potentially ongoing supports for individuals who were not able to stop using alcohol during pregnancy. However, there are a number of significant gaps in current preventive efforts. As I mentioned, the public education campaigns that many of us might be familiar with, although effective in raising a population's awareness about FASD, are not sufficient alone to impact behaviors, particularly among those who are in fact at highest risk of alcohol use in pregnancy. Um, and one thing that's important to keep in mind is that use of alcohol in pregnant individuals occurs within a complex web of other factors factors, including experiences of interpersonal violence, poverty, mental illness, and social isolation. And these are often also the individuals who are most at risk of so-called falling through the cracks of our service system because of a lack of coordinated systems, which tend to treat each of these issues in isolation rather than together using integrated multidisciplinary approaches. So this has led to much literature on the importance of a person-centered trauma-informed framework for understanding alcohol use in pregnancy. And this framework really recognizes that alcohol use in pregnancy again occurs within this complex system of different uh, other risk factors, including violence, mental illness and other substance use, chronic illness and disability, poverty and barriers to good nutrition, young age and multiple stressors and exposures to other forms of oppression such as systemic racism. 
So just to sort of highlight these factors again, we know that this means an importance of understanding barriers in terms of this trauma-informed perspective. And of course, we know that each of these factors are themselves barriers to accessing care, including, again, systemic and institutional racism, housing and food insecurity, histories of trauma and interpersonal violence, mental illness and other substance use, and then practical barriers as well related to childcare and transportation issues, and fear of stigma, judgment, and even child protective services involvement. And so what does this mean in terms of tailoring and accessibility of services? Well, this means that there needs to be a more systemic approach to FASD prevention with strong linkages between multiple levels of preventive efforts and integrated and multidisciplinary care. These are approaches that must be trauma-informed and culturally appropriate and sensitive to people's histories of experiencing violence and other forms of oppression. Also important is the need to consider care in a holistic manner, so needing to also target things like overall health, income, housing, and other social needs in order to be successful. Now, this is challenging, of course. It requires collaboration across systems that are typically siloed and integration of different care approaches. So, for example, by addressing mental health and substance use in the same setting. Um, but what I really want to focus on as well are three specific practical barriers to care that I think sometimes get a little bit less attention. So these include distance and transportation, a lack of accommodations for individuals who have disabilities, and language barriers as well. So I'll start off by focusing on distance and transportation. Many of you might be aware that research shows that there are higher rates of alcohol and substance use in rural areas. However, there is often a real lack of multidisciplinary care and treatment options in these areas. Research shows that individuals in rural areas are three times more likely to list accessibility as a barrier to care for uh, factors related to alcohol use in pregnancy and some actually report traveling up to several hours to receive services. Now, I'm sure Dr. Uh, Juma can comment on some of the practicalities of this, but there is research to suggest that creative approaches such as uh, mobile clinics and consultation via video conference can be very effective ways of getting care into rural and remote areas. Um, also effective is the integration of substance use and primary care services, so a real role for family physicians, as we've heard from Dr. Graves. Um, also with the option of having teleconsultation for primary care providers to make sure that they have access to the expertise that they may, may need for more complex sorts of situations. Um, another important barrier to care that I think maybe people don't think very much about is accommodations for individuals with disabilities. There's research to suggest that people with disabilities are at elevated risk for alcohol and substance use disorders. Now, there are complex reasons for these risks, and they relate to many of the social and structural determinants of health that I mentioned earlier, including elevated risk of people with disabilities experiencing violence, poverty, barriers to care, and other forms of systemic discrimination. However, despite their elevated risk, People with disabilities also are more likely to experience barriers to accessing substance-related preventive and treatment services. Again, there are a number of reasons for this. Some include negative attitudes by healthcare providers, including a so-called double stigma of experiencing both disability and substance use. And there are also very practical barriers to care, including physical inaccessibility of healthcare uh, settings, such as inability to uh, move mobility devices around different types of settings, and communication related barriers, such as barriers to accessing ASL interpretation, as well as a lack of provider knowledge about disability and the requirement to provide appropriate accommodations. And then finally, of course, other social determinants of health, such as poverty, can also act as an important barrier as well. 
So to address these issues, I think there's a real need for training of program staff and healthcare providers to be aware of the unique needs of people with disabilities, including factors such as communication and learning needs, as well as the need for all healthcare spaces to be physically accessible. And addressing these issues does require collaboration with disability organizations and people with lived experience of disability to understand appropriate approaches. And finally, a brief comment about language. Now there is research to suggest that reported rates of alcohol use in pregnancy may be lower in immigrant and refugee populations compared to Canadian born women. However, there is data to suggest that language barriers are a significant issue in terms of accessing mental health and substance use related care for those who do need care. And interpretation services, for example, are rarely available, and prevention and treatment services also rarely consider the cultural appropriateness of their services, including the need to consider additional stigma and shame-related considerations that may be associated with alcohol use for certain groups. And so these barriers really do speak to the need to consider the availability of practical resources such as interpreters for such programs, training and cultural competency for providers, and attention to other social determinants of health. And so broadly, I think these considerations point to the need for flexible, tailored prevention and treatment approaches that attend to multiple facets of accessibility. So I want to turn now to a little bit of a different perspective on FASD supports, thinking about this in terms of a long-term perspective. So most of our time today is really focused on supporting people who may be at risk for or using alcohol in the perinatal period, including efforts to encourage people to stop using alcohol, um, as well as treatment for those who may need extra support. There's also a rich body of literature, of course, on the supports and services for children who have FASD and their parents. But I think it's also important to remember that children with FASD, of course, grow up and women with FASD themselves may have unique needs related to their own pregnancies. And this is a particular uh, research interest of mine. So why is this important? I think we heard this from one of the other speakers, but FASD is the most common cause of developmental disability in Canada. 4% of Canadians have FASD and rates are believed to be even higher in some groups. As adults, women with FASD also have higher rates of mental illness and substance use themselves and are at elevated risk for experiencing interpersonal violence compared to individuals without FASD. Now, what's really important to consider in the context of reproductive health and pregnancy is that these factors themselves are known risk factors for maternal and newborn complications. However, individuals with FASD and other developmental disabilities often themselves experience barriers to prenatal care, and research shows that they are more likely to enter prenatal care late and to receive fewer than the recommended number of visits. Uh, uh, according to SOGC guidelines compared to individuals without developmental disabilities. Emerging evidence also suggests that they're more likely to experience pregnancy complications, including rare but devastating outcomes like severe maternal morbidity and maternal mortality. And so what does this mean for support for individuals with FASD during pregnancy? Um, so I just want to flag a resource that is available through Health Nexus that was created uh, by myself and some colleagues in collaboration with uh, Health Nexus. Um, and this is a support tool, a childbirth preparation support tool for individuals with FASD and other uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities that can be completed with a support person in order to communicate individuals' needs to pregnancy care providers. So the tool includes a number of different sections that can be filled out, and this includes information on support people that are currently in individuals' lives and their current medical and mental health needs. They can also make note of any sensory communication and memory needs that the provider should take into consideration when interacting with them. 
and to try to facilitate linkages with any social services that may be uh, required. They can also indicate concerns and questions related to personal safety and relationships, their financial situation, as well as housing. And finally, to help patients and providers to think ahead about post-pregnancy, they can indicate their postpartum and parenting needs, like whether they may need extra help learning to care for their newborn or managing their postpartum mental health. So this is a document that's really meant to be able to help educate physicians and healthcare providers on the needs of a patient with FASD and pregnancy, but also to ease some of the patient's concerns or fears about involvement with the healthcare system and act as a resource to facilitate communication and continuity between appointments and across care providers. And again, I think this document really speaks to the theme of, you know, improving accessibility for care related to FASD. Um, so I'll just conclude by saying that I think accessibility really requires some tailoring and flexibility, as well as a long-term and holistic view of the needs of women during pregnancy. Um, I put my contact information on the screen in case there are any questions, and I look forward to uh, the discussion that will follow later. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. Oh my gosh, there's still a hundred of you out there. So whew, everybody do a little wiggle because you've been, oops, you've been sitting for a while. So we have our final speaker before you get to have a little chat with everybody. Uh, Natalie's going to talk to you and she's going to talk to you, I think, an amazing way to end this webinar on a Friday afternoon, caring for each other, caring for our systems, caring for our communities, caring for our people. And after I read this, I really was wishing that you were here to give me a big, huge hug because that's how I felt after I read your, your talk. So welcome, Natalie. And I hope all of you will feel the love um, after Natalie's talk. Over to you. Merci, Jocelyn, for the introduction. Um, today, I am going to be talking about Indigenous harm reduction and what I've learned um, in my 20 uh, years or nearly 20 years of, of being a practicing midwife serving the community. So Jocelyn captured it. She got the whole thing. I titled my presentation Caring for Each Other uh, because the core to substance use conversations uh, it is the core, the caring, um, and it's that's the concept that uh, we need for one another. So in our Indigenous communities, we have so much love and care, and that care um, happens uh, amongst each other in the community. Um, if you're like myself as a Métis care provider, as an Indigenous care provider to your clients, um, but it's also about caring for ourselves as a team. And so, um, we're going to sort of talk about that today and really look at um, look at harm reduction from the Indigenous perspective um, that includes that love and care, but also that ensures that Indigenous people um, that are receiving our care um, are not only included in the decision making, but that they are our compass um, in defining um, their own healing journey. So. Um, I'd like to start by saying that what I'm going to be sharing today um, are the learnings from my years in the community and the community-led conversations that I've been privileged to be a part of and that have been uh, given permission for me to share um, uh, both those community conversations, but also individual stories um, and my learnings from serving individuals. And I think the perspectives that I'm sharing and the narratives from our communities um, really are looking beyond, um, uh, you know, substance use disorders or alcohol use in pregnancy um, and the social or structural determinants of health that often accompany them. I think the way in which um, our communities like to talk about this is looking um, towards transformation and to take um, a strength-based perspective. Um, we have a lot of stories about um, overcoming um, and surviving very difficult things. And so um, I like to think about this as a continuum of, of those, um, those stories and how we're, we're overcoming um, 
uh, within the space. So I think working together is at the heart of what we do um, as Indigenous communities and those strong webs of relationships that uh, that I, I really appreciated Dr. Hillary Brown's comments on that need for collaboration um, and integrated supports and that holistic like way of approaching care is very much um, is very much a uh, solution oriented way. And so uh, I'll get you to advance the slide for me, please. So today um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the caring ecosystem. So how do we create that ecosystem for trust and healing? And how are we being people and community centered? So talking about practices that support indigenous life givers and um, reclaim Indigenous ways of being, thinking, and doing in our care. And lastly, caring for the caregiver, um, because this is <laughs> heart work. So when I was preparing my speaking notes, I wrote, I was trying to write hard work, and then it turned into heart work. And I was like, yeah, that's why it's hard. <laughs> and caring for each other um, includes caring for the life giver and their family, um, transforming social narratives, caring for our care team and each other, caring for ourselves and caring for the systems in which we work. So slide number three, I'm gonna talk a little bit about addictions um, from a cultural lens. And so um, I think addiction and use of alcohol has many definitions. Um, I've come to see addiction as a manifestation of where one person is at on their own healing journey. Um, uh, as Indigenous people across Turtle Island, we've survived land theft, city encroachment, bringing things that we didn't want in our territory, like alcohol and drugs, loss of language, residential schools, forced removal of children, and that is quite a bit of pain. We call that trauma, and we know that trauma is one of the reasons people use alcohol to cope with that pain. And so when we change that conversation and we move away from talking about addiction, and we when we talk about healing, I think that is a harm reduction approach. And so as um, part of it too, is always thinking about our care in a way that prevents further infliction of pain and trauma. So healing journeys, as we know, are most often not binary paths. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the public health messaging sort of using the, these very binary like messages um, between like abstinence and, um, and using. There seems to be, you know, I think harm reduction really makes a space uh, for a lot more steps in between. Um, often, you know, when we care for our clients um, who are using alcohol, it's um, one step forward and a few steps back. Um, for many, for some, it can be a linear path, like crossing a bridge. Um, for most, <laughs> it's going around the bridge, taking time to look at the clouds, pausing, falling, stumbling, getting back up again. But I think most importantly, it's that each healing journey is unique. And our job as caregivers is easing that path for each life giver and pregnant person to make sure that it's working for them and that they're ready and want to move forward. Um, I think that concept uh, uh, with, like embedded within harm reduction is that concept of self-determination, which for us as indigenous people, it's about um, being inclusive. So it's that nothing about you without you, um, unless we are working together. And I'm going to make sure that you feel loved and cared for um, in what you think will work best. Can change the slide. So foundation, foundational to safety um, is understanding um, sort of the lived reality of, of Indigenous folks who are using alcohol. So. Um, as Lisa mentioned, they're often experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness, or they're hungry or cold, or um, a lot of people with addiction don't feel safe um, or supported. They just feel judged by like all of society. 
um, and feel like they just have all of these things against them. And like comments like, you know, you just need to clean up or um, is not like the beginning of an approach where um, people can even feel safe to broach these topics. And so um, when I'm caring people for people who are using substances, I don't go in with an agenda that I need people to be clean. Um, I want you to be happy and healthy. And if you're actively using, that is your individual choice. And that's not going to change how I'm going to treat you. So I think um, understanding that health services weren't built with Indigenous people in mind, that there is that historic and ongoing sort of colonial force that is impacting Indigenous people's experience within the healthcare system um, has bred a lot of mistrust um, for Indigenous people. Um, sometimes when things are being asked or folks are being told what to do, it's maybe perceived as social control. And so um, I think that we just have to keep in mind that institutions have not, our health institutions have not always had good relationships um, with Indigenous people and that it's not unusual for Indigenous people to have negative um, experiences in healthcare. So I think if our starting place as providers um, is not assuming that healthcare is a safe place or that it's the first place an Indigenous person thinks of going, um, if they're worried about their health, um, I think it's, it, it allows us to put ourselves in the right mindset. And you can move to the next slide. So, um, this is a timeline of reports outlining the experiences of colonialism and harm and genocide. In our health counts report, 71% of Indigenous adults who reported racism from healthcare providers said it prevented, stopped, or delayed them from returning to health services. Um, there's also uh, data in Manitoba that suggests that um, some of the Indigenous women in our core, um, in the core inner city area, are only going to access care by their second pregnancy. So it's our responsibility to read these reports because I think they are the underpinning and the root causes of substance use disorders that life givers and their families are experiencing. And move to slide six. So this is our work and it's our shared responsibility. Um, some of the ways that I've seen to be successful is to sort support leadership um, in communities um, with meaningful financial support and allyship in our programming, um, looking at um, keep, keeping people safe um, when they're drinking or using, um, supporting people on their healing journey, um, and creating an accessible range of treatments um, and providing sort of a range of options. Slide seven. And I think one of the things that we have to remember is that what we do affects the next seven generations. So from my perspective, um, it's my responsibility to look out for and to care for people. And we look at this like um, as, as a human family, that's our responsibility. And so bringing culture back um, into our lives is often a way to, to sort of rest restore um, some of that healing. Also, we know that a lot of people um, may also have lost like some of their kinship ties and their relationships. And those are ways um, helping to connect people and caring for people um, is part of their healing, um, telling stories um, and Th those are all like harm reduction sort of strategies. Um, so slide eight. So um, the binary thinking doesn't serve us. Um, so going back to our roots and learning from how our ancestors and uh, elders see and know things, um, how we support um, and love our people and we create safe places where people can gather and feel a sense of community that is the space where healing can begin and where um, sort of 
the not only responding to um, the issues of alcohol, but understanding their root causes. Um, so I think it's it's important as healthcare providers for us to think about what are the ways in which we can collaborate with community to, um, to create those spaces. Outside the clinic, there's important conversations that need our attention. I really appreciated uh, Nana's present presentation. Um, I think, um, you know, there's important conversations um, happening around uh, the need to sort of decolonize, um, decolonizing addiction that in a way that benefits everybody um, and help shift that consciousness and bring an awareness of what kind of messaging um, is out there and, and how it is really um, confusing and having everybody, including society sort of on the same page um, is important. And um, I think also, uh, Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> um, I think just ensuring that we move away from the fearful and shameful ways um, that often re um, that often reinforce isolation, um, and that that opposite of addiction is connection. So, slide number four, I'm going to talk about a little bit about caring for the caregiver. Um, I think as we care. Um, for folks who who have addiction or who are um, maybe drinking in their pregnancy, um, these I, I think that at times um, when we're aware of that trauma, it can be very difficult. Um, particularly as Indigenous providers caring for our own communities, we carry our own trauma. Um, I think starting with that awareness that trauma is different for everybody. Um, and understanding your own like warning signs or trigger signs. Um, you might like begin to have a, more anxiety or depression, even as a care provider, um, self-blame or shame or guilt. Um, you might have a reduced hope for the future. Um, sometimes it's nightmares, insomnia. I think like acknowledging that range of emotions that can come from working in complex spaces of trauma um, is one is is that one place of learning around awareness. And then I think the next step is looking at support. So reaching out to kind of avoid internalizing the negativity. You know, we have to talk with our support systems. And this is why it's so important to not be working in this space as an isolated primary care provider, like you know, creating a team where you're working with other people um, and you're able to talk about what's going on. And also taking the time to reach out to mental health professionals, um, having them be, be part of your care team, but also having um, get that access to that care for yourself as a care provider. And some of that I've really found in my own network of, of uh, care providers and Indigenous care providers um, out there. And grounding um, is that seeking sort of that guidance from our trusted mentors and other people who are doing the work. Um, I think part of it is also about centering ourselves and remembering our skills and our capacities, but also the like boundaries of how much we're responsible for um, and what we can truly affect. And, and I think um, looking at all the ways that like are safe and comfortable for you uh, to, to branch out, like for me doing some of that change in shifting social consciousness work or that public health type messaging in the community has been part of my own healing because I feel like I'm shifting or adding a dimensionality to, um, to the work that's equally as important to shifting the like experience that folks are going to be having um, when they are getting care from, from us. And then lastly, um, care. So, um, oh, no, sorry, not the last slide, but the last sort of element of caring for ourselves. Um, is care. So recognize and attend to the negative impacts to your emotional, psychological, and social well-beings. 
set those boundaries when you need to take a break and remind yourself um, that you're worthy of that same love, care, and support that you give to your clients. And, um, and yes, now you can go to my last slide. So I think it's just remembering that um, we have a responsibility to never cause harm. Um, and I'm always reminded of Phil Fontaine's, uh, our former grand chief, that the answers lie in our communities. And so um, those partnerships, those intercollaborative um, ways of addressing the multitude of realities that encompass addiction, and that I believe the way forward is in our strong relationships. Um, and so I also added my um, email there where you can reach me. You can see my son all proud with his bannock because he is a serious bannock maker. <laughs> and I'm going to pass it back to Jocelyn so that we have time for questions. Perfect. And I'm passing it over to Malu, who has a process for us to follow. But thank you, Natalie. Um, as usual, amazing uh, talk and a great way, I think, to put us all into perspective for our pontifications on the weekend, especially from some of us who are awake from 4 to 6 a.m. thinking about things. So I think this gives us a great opportunity to, to, to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Malu, who has a few quick things, and then we'll go to questions and get your weekend started. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to thank you all the, the panelists for the wonderful presentations that uh, that the, were just given. And thank you to the attendees for, for listening. All right. I'm going to stop sharing now and we can move on to the Q&A. OK, I'll ask a question. So <laughs> so so given um, some of the discussion that we've had in terms of we've gone from the, I guess, individuals and sort of thinking about the culture and uh, around alcohol and the, and the public perceptions, and we've gone to the healthcare provider, um, you know, guidelines and, and sort of what they can do around asking questions and building that relationships and supporting things. And we've talked about some of the community approaches and that whole continuum of caring and then being able to access actually the supports and services. So what, what can we do better? I think, um, and, and I know it's a big question, but we've been doing, trying to do things and make a difference for a really long time. And I'm not really sure how well we're moving that needle in terms of, of making a difference. And so, um, you know, some of us have been in this field for again, a really long time. And so we continue to do the messaging, we continue to do the work, we continue to try to work together with all of the folks to try to figure out how best to have the best very outcomes for moms and babies, because everybody, all the moms want the best outcomes for the, their babies. And so how, how, I don't know how, but any ideas, I think, for all of us as we sort of regroup around um, these things and try to think about supports and values and, and, and language moving forward, I think is, is a really interesting discussion. So any ideas I think would be welcome. Go. I'll, start, Go I'll, 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 I'll jump in Jocelyn and, and, and. Thank you, Lisa, five You're bucks welcome. for you. I, I actually am very optimistic, and I think that part of it is thinking, we have to think of it and, and frame this, I think, in a number of things that, that you know, that some of this is going to be done, you know, individual provider, individual community by, like, it's going to be, it may be small steps, and we need to celebrate those small steps on the, on the prevention side as much as we tell our patients to celebrate the small steps on the other side. So I think... I have some hope that that through each of us being annoying and pushing the button and you know doing what what certainly I do in the education field we we are moving people in the right direction and you know um, um, I started looking after individuals who are substance using in pregnancy when I came back from uh, maternity leave with my twins um, who may wander in across the bath background. Um, it's been a long time. Um, they're six foot three. They're not babies anymore. They're grown ups. 
And when I think back about where we were when, when I made this decision that uh, this would be a nice a nice way to keep things nice and quiet and regulated in my practice coming back to work as a new mom um, that 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 things have changed that the discussions that we're having the openness of 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 all of other providers to have this conversation really is changing um, there they go um, and so I think that that I hold um, I, I do hold the fact that we've gone from a um, a place where we didn't talk about this at all when I started to something that is part of sort of regular screening and regular conversation. So I just thought I'd share with you that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that we're making progress. I don't think it's as big of a leap as we'd like, but the fact that, you know, I don't, you know, the fact that I don't have to convince people to have this conversation, convince people that we should be having this discussion, the fact that a hundred people would show up on a Friday afternoon to have this conversation, I think that, you know, it, we are not voices alone in the wilderness um, as we were 27 years ago, but I think that, but I, I think there's a lot of room for both um, big gestures, but I think each one of us, if we commit to some of those smaller gestures, sometimes that's the way that you get into the crevices and make change. So that's where I think we are making some progress. I just think that that, that lengthy, you know, that, that lens looking backwards has been helpful for me in terms of thinking about, you know, you know, what it used to be like when it was a few of us huddled in a room together. Perfect. And I think what we're trying to do as a collective, I think, is talk about healthy pregnancy. And this is a part of healthy pregnancy and best outcomes. And so when we think about all of those things, it's not just this, like, you know, it's, it's all these things that we're supposed to be doing, not me never having a pregnancy again, been there, done that, but having a healthy pregnancy, it's a, it's, it's a, it's the whole package and it's, you know, it's, it's exciting and it's important to, to support that and remind that. So we do have a question in the chat, any, uh, any success journey that Natalie can share with her clients? Sure. I'll share. Um, I might start by sharing like a programmatic um, success story that I think was really exciting. Um, so one of our, in Manitoba, um, midwives are often placed in community health clinics. So we're working with various other care, healthcare providers, or we're at least co-located with other care providers and have that option to kind of more easily um, do that integrated support. So um, in one of the community health clinics where I worked, um, we initiated a, it was actually based out of a research project that was a com combined effort between public health and midwifery, um, where we were trying to access folks uh, who wouldn't normally be accessing care. So that meant leaving the clinic and not being um, in the clinic as a way of like, um, helping, helping to be more accessible. So um, we started to chat um, with our public health um, folks and just to, to really understand like where are pregnant people going and like, are they accessing any services that where midwifery could be helpful? Um, so we started to position ourselves in various um, uh, friendship centers, in various um, um, uh, pardon, um, healthy baby sites um, because they were incentivized spaces that had food, childcare, um, people would come. And so at the beginning, I would just like introduce myself and say, oh, like, by the way, sometimes I would, I would deliver some like public health messaging and, and content, but mostly I would just kind of sit in the back and I told people like, I'm here, I'm a midwife. If you want to listen to your baby or do your blood pressure, um, or just have questions about what's going on with your pregnancy, you can come and see me. So the, the whole point was actually to like, have people come and see us who were, and, and so people would approach us, and they were often unattached, meaning they did not have a primary care provider, had not seen anybody in their pregnancy, um, and often had issues related to substance use. And, um, and so it was a real opportunity to uh, take a harm reduction approach, um, take a patient led approach to care and begin a chart on the person and begin to offer some of the, the messaging in a safe way and in a way that was really patient directed and um, make sure that their file um, was sent to the hospital if they were to show up because we have a lot of people who show up um, and give birth and haven't received any care. 
Um, I could draw people's blood on the spot. Um, I could offer next time we could coordinate it to go have an ultrasound and I could drive them there. It was all about like that le like individual level facilitation um, of care, which um, and if and options to like they could continue and come see me at at Mount Carmel Clinic or come to a different place. So I think like that outreach really began um, in that spirit or in that idea of uh, of understanding that the clinic wasn't even the safe place for a lot of people to show up. And so it was trying to find what where were those community spaces, be it the soup kitchen, be it the to say like, hey, I'm here and like literally just offer people what it is that they want and what they're interested in. And as you build that trust, people um, people were able to, to be interested in hearing some of the different messaging and things that you had to share. So that's one of my um, things that I want to share. Okay, I'm just looking to see so many thank yous to everybody. And we're done. Oh my gosh, we're done. So <laughs> it's my job to say thank you to everybody, Natalie and Nana, who had to run off. Oh, she's back. She had to go do surgery, but she's back. Um, Hillary and Lisa and Malou and Katerina and Wendy and all of you 66 people who stayed on until the very end.